Well, I think we're about ready to begin tonight. Welcome to our study of the book of Hebrews. We'll be in Hebrews chapter 9, but as uh, we are accustomed to doing in this Hebrew study, we're actually going to begin with an Old Testament passage from Exodus chapter 26. If you want to turn over there, we're going to read that entire chapter as we get into our study tonight. Now, before we do that, let's uh, recite our memory verse together. Acts chapter 17 and verse 6. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren to the rulers of the city, saying, those who have turned the world upside down have come here. All right, so let's turn over to Exodus chapter 26. Exodus chapter 26. Now, as we have been thinking about the true tabernacle in heaven, and we've noticed already in our study, and we're going to certainly notice in our study tonight, how the Old Testament tabernacle, that which was prescribed to Moses by God, was representative. As we read Exodus chapter 26, what I would ask you to do is try to visualize what we're reading. It may be a little difficult at points. Try to visualize what we're reading. Think about what that could have looked like, uh, and think about how detailed the directions were that God gave to Moses and how important that is when we think about its representation of something that was to come uh, in, in, or through Christ. So Exodus chapter 26. Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine woven linen and blue, purple, and scarlet thread. With artistic designs of cherubim, you shall weave them. The length of each curtain shall be 28 cubits and the width of each curtain four cubits. And every one of the curtains shall have the same measurements. Five curtains shall be coupled to one another, and the other five curtains shall be coupled to one another. And you shall make loops of blue yarn on the edge of the curtain, on the selvage of one uh, one set. And likewise you shall do on the outer edge of the other curtain of the second set. Fifty loops you shall make in the one curtain, and fifty loops you shall make on the edge of the curtain that is on the end of the second set that the loops may be clasped to one another. And you shall make 50 clasps of gold and couple the curtains together with the clasps so that it may be one tabernacle. You shall also make curtains of goat's hair to be a tent over the tabernacle. You shall make 11 curtains. The length of each curtain shall be 30 cubits and the width of each curtain four cubits. And the 11 curtains shall all have the same measurements. And you shall, uh, you shall couple five curtains by themselves and six curtains by themselves. And you shall double over the sixth curtain at the forefront of the tent. You shall make 50 loops on the edge of the curtain that is outermost in one set. And 50 loops on the edge of the curtain of the second set. And you shall make 50 bronze clasps and put the clasps into the loops. And couple the tent together that it may be one. The remnant that remains of the curtains of the tent, the half curtain that remains, shall hang over the back of the tabernacle. And, the cur- cu- and a cubit on one side and a cubit on the other side of what remains of the length of the curtains of the tent shall hang over the sides of the tabernacle on this side and on that side to cover it. You shall also make a covering of ram skins dyed red for the tent and a covering of badger skins above that. And for the tabernacle you shall make the boards of acacia wood standing upright. Ten cubits shall be the length of a board, and a cubit and a half shall be the width of each board. Two tenons shall be in each board for binding one to another. Thus you shall make for all the boards of the tabernacle. And you shall make the boards for the tabernacle, twenty boards for the south side. You shall make forty sockets of silver under the twenty boards, two sockets under each of the boards for its two tenons. And for the second side of the tabernacle, the north side, there shall be twenty boards, and there forty sockets of silver, two sockets under each of the boards. For the far side of the tabernacle, westward, you shall make six boards, and you shall also make two boards for the two back corners of the tabernacle. They shall be coupled together at the bottom, and they shall be coupled together at the top by one ring. Thus it shall be for both of them. They shall be for the two corners. So there shall be eight boards with their sockets of silver, sixteen sockets, two sockets under each of the boards. And you shall make bars of acacia wood, five of the boards on one side of the tabernacle, five for the boards on the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards on the side of the tabernacle for the far side westward. The middle bar shall pass through the midst of the boards from end to end, 
You shall overlay the boards with gold, make their rings of gold as holders for the bars, and overlay the bars with gold. And you shall raise up the tabernacle according to its pattern, which you were shown on the mountain. You shall make a veil woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and fine woven linen. It shall be woven with an artistic design of cherubim. You shall hang it upon the four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be gold upon four sockets of silver. And you shall hang the veil from the clasps. Then you shall bring the ark of the testimony in there behind the veil. The veil shall be a divider for you between the holy place and the most holy. You shall put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy. You shall set the table outside the veil and the lampstand across from the table on the side of the tabernacle toward the south, and you shall put the table on the north side. You shall make a screen for the door of the tabernacle woven of blue, purple, and scarlet thread and fine woven linen made by a weaver. And you shall make for the screen five pillars of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Their hooks shall be gold, and you shall cast five sockets of bronze for them. Thank you so much, Brother Kyle, for uh, reading that link- lengthy passage. And I asked him to, to read that for, for a couple fold. I think it's pretty obvious f- when God has a plan, he wants us to follow that plan. And, and when he gave the Israelites that plan for that tabernacle, how much detail that they had to follow and what God required of them in order for it to be pleasing to him. And secondarily... Notice that the word tabernacle, who who knows what the word tabernacle actually means when it's translated? Anyone? It actually translates as the word tent or dwelling place, okay? And so the significance of when God made this first covenant with them, it was a temporary uh, structure in order for him to dwell among them, among his people. And so... As we, we move into to chapter 9 this evening, let's think back on what the importance of um, Christ's role is in our life and how his role as a high priest and what the high priest would have done in the tabernacles um, and how that translates to us today and how um, our only hope of salvation is through Jesus. And when he died on the cross, the veil was, in the, was ripped um, from, from top to bottom, and that, you know, is, is amazing. And now he is how we go to God. He is our mediator. And so as we look through that this evening, just think back uh, and keep that in kind of in the back of your mind. Um, and also think about who the Hebrew writer is writing to, right? Those, those Hebrews would have known um, and been very familiar with this. And so as he kind of walks us through the setting of, of the tabernacle, uh, it would, be, it would have been extremely significant to them, talking to them in that language, and why it was so important to, to establish the temporary nature of the tabernacle. <clears throat> and so turn with me. Let's go ahead and turn over to Hebrews chapter 9. And uh, beginning in uh, verse 13 of chapter 8, it says, In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. This moves us into our discussion here in chapter 9 of the earthly sanctuary, of transitioning from the old covenant to the new covenant. And then the author later on in the passage will talk about the... um, the heavenly sanctuary, or, or the, the perfect sanctuary, um, or permanent sanctuary, excuse me, which we know is heaven. Um, that is where God dwells. He dwelt with his, his people in the tabernacle, and now the, the permanent tabernacle is in heaven with him. And so, as we begin chapter 9, the author um, points out two things about it. One, it's shadow, or a model, or a copy of what was to come and thus show its inadequacy. 
and two, to remind its readers of its earthly and temporary nature, and thus the earthly and temporary nature of the entire mosaical system. And so all through the Old Testament, we have the prophecies and foretelling of the Messiah. It completed the Old Covenant when Jesus came and fulfilled um, the old co- fulfilled the prophecies. He died on the cross for our sins, and now we are under the New Covenant. And so consider um, the audience, like I said before, why did, why did they need to be reminded of this? You know, they've been urged the entire, entire chapter not to fall, slip back and fall back into um, uh, their old ways of, of their friends and families would have been pressuring them um, to, to leave Christianity and go back to, to Judaism. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's read uh, um, uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 through 10. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinance of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer, the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the covenant, wherein was the gold pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. And over it, the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of of God. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present in which we were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and cardinal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Okay. So, if you open your your, uh, books up to to page 21, we'll go through the questions to kind of work our way through chapter 9. And the first question says, how does Hebrews describe the earthly tabernacle and its contents? (coughs) Who would like to to describe to us how the writer describes the uh, earthly tabernacle? Okay. So there's a few different ways there in verses, uh, the first five verses. The ordinances were of divine service and earthly sanctuary. Even the first covenant had ordinances. The earthly tabernacle and its contents were associated with the first covenant. God had provided instructions regarding their construction and use, which Brother Kyle just read for us. Theirs was used in a divine service. And the term sanctuary reminds us that the tabernacle was set apart for the specific purpose God intended. It's important to understand that, that if he gave that lengthy set of rules for how to build the tabernacle, he also gave a lengthy set of rules through the rest of Exodus and on through Leviticus of how to worship, how to, what the priests were required to do, who could enter the, the tabernacle, who could enter the holiest of holies. Only the high priest once a year could enter the holiest of holies. And inside the holies of holies was the uh, Ark of the Covenant. Uh, it also describes the earthly tabernacle as being prepared. God did not provide the tabernacle miraculously. He provided the pattern for how it was to be built and how to be used. Israel was charged with preparing the tabernacle and its contents themselves for service to God. And he gives us a similar set of instructions about how we are to worship and how we are to follow it. And so we have, just like the Israelites were given a strict set of commands, 
we have to be wary of, of how we worship God and, and, and where we gain our, our authority for the things we do in our worship to Him. <clears throat> and inside the sanctuary uh, was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread. <clears throat> Behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle is called the Holiest of Holies, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which the golden pot of manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. The veil that separated the sanctuary from the holiest of all represented the separation between God and man. And like I alluded to before, that, that veil, when man sinned, we were separated from God. And it was through the old covenant that they were able to offer sacrifices of bulls and goats, for their sins to be rolled forward. And it wasn't until Christ came, lived on earth as a man, suffered the things that we suffered, and then offered himself for a sacrifice so that our sins could be washed away and we could have that reunion with God. Christ serving as our, our mediator ripped that veil, and so we are allowed to go to God through Jesus. <clears throat> And speaking of the uh, uh, Ark of the Covenant, um, and above it were cherubims of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. This is the holiest of all contained no image of God. God's presence was symbolized by the cloud of smoke that filled the holiest of all when incense was burned in the censer at the entrance room. Israel's God was invisible to them. They could not see him, and only the high priest could go in once a year even to enter into that that presence after offering blood for the remission of his own sins for his own cleansing before he could enter into that holies of holies any comments on the earthly tabernacle i'm doing a lot of talking i'd love to hear from y'all yeah it's so impressive to think about some of what you just said regarding God's presence among people and how the tabernacle represented God's presence, but it wasn't the, the tabernacle itself nor any image within the tabernacle was an object of worship. Uh, it was really a way that God showed that he was separate from the people, and so there's a problem that we're going to read about here in Hebrews related to that separation that Christ came to resolve. Great comments. Anyone else? Stu. I'm curious your thoughts on this, Kyle, maybe as well. Is there any significance behind the use of the tabernacle as opposed to the use, the use of the Herodian temple that was actually still in existence at the time? It goes mm -hmm. back to the yeah. first, to the same covenant that was in effect mm -hmm. the tabernacle and the temple. But he goes to the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. the, my thoughts and, and I'll let me know if you, you feel the same way. The, the, the temple was built in the, same, in the same manner that the tabernacle was built. But the comparison is, is because the tabernacle was a temporary structure. It was a tent. They used it. It moved along with them. And so I think the writer here is wanting to ensure that the, the, the Christians understood the temporary nature of the Old Covenant versus the permanent um, covenant that we have with Jesus. Joanna? Also, I, the temple was an allowance that God allowed them. I think his design was for them to always use the tabernacle until David asked, can we build you a temple? And so I think that's why they go back to the tabernacle, because that was the, the design the plan. But sure. I think the temple was another allowance, like giving them a king. king. Mm -hmm. A thought absolutely. Well, building on what you just said, I just think about the time at which Hebrews was written and how many hundreds and hundreds of years have passed since Israel actually worshiped at the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. you know, it would be impactful for me if I was a Christian to think about what God had instituted through Moses in the building of the tabernacle and how that tabernacle didn't last very long, you know, compared to relatively. Yeah. Yeah, 
and, and the fact that, like you said, the, the tabernacle and there, all its contents were lost the, well before the, the time that this is written. Um, but I'm sure it would have been well remembered and well deeply rooted in, their, in that culture that they would have understood what the tabernacle was, what went into building it, the laws laid out in, in the way they were written in order for them to understand. And so when, in my mind, it, it, it's, it's the temporary nature of it that, that he's trying to drive home because, I, you know, if it's me, I like to go camping. I, li- I like to be out, out in nature and, and have a tent. But I also know that when I get home, I have a, a, a home that has a, a roof and brick and I'm safe and out of the elements and I am, I am home. And to me, that's kind of a, a, a little bit of, of a, a likeness there that, you know, they were traveling through the wilderness um, and, and God gave them this first covenant that was temporary in nature. And now we have a permanent home in heaven courtesy of God's grace that he sent his son to establish the new covenant for us. Amen. Yes. Uh, just to talk a bit, it could also be that some of the unbelieving Jews during Jesus' time, uh, and even after, like the Stephen, they started looking at the temple as a, almost like an idol, like a, a thing to worship itself, not that God was in there, and that's who should be worship, but, but the building itself. I mean, they say that to Stephen. They say one of the charges is that he spoke against the temple. Yeah. So maybe the altar may be trying to take their view away from the temple to say the temple is not what matters. Go back even beyond that to the tabernacle. <laughs> kind of like what Joanna said, that that was the original design that God wanted to be uh, in, in the middle of his people and allow his glory to be manifested to the people. That's how God originally did it. So maybe that he's trying to see that the temple doesn't need to matter as far as the building goes. That's a great point. And, and the way they treated the temple, the whole purpose of going to the tabernacle was to worship. To go to the temple was to worship. And yet the, the, the Jews turned the temple into, to, like you said, almost like an idol. Uh, yes? So I'm trying to figure out where that is. But is it by then, the Ark of the Covenant, there's somewhere in the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant is gone. Yes. It is gone. The Ark of the Covenant is no longer in the temple. So here you have a temple, and we never hear of God talking about where his glory comes and fill it anymore. So, you know, that's, that's very much in line with something that, you know, if you're coming about this more temporary nature, mm-hmm. there are better things to come, because we don't see any of these things happening again. And surely enough, the holiness of holy is supposed to have the Apple Covenant, but the Apple Covenant is not there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it was all gone and, and all lost at, at some point in time. Okay. So, um, from verses 6 and 7, How often did the high priest enter the most holy place behind the second veil, and upon which day was he authorized to enter it? Veil once a year, yeah, specifically to offer sacrifices for that particular year. Yes. Yes. And so the only the high priest could enter the holy so holy, and it was once per year on the day of atonement, and not without blood. It's very important that that he was he was a sinful man just like we are. The high priest had to offer um sacrifices to cleanse himself before he could go in um, to the holiest of holy. And it's interesting that that God would appear in the holiest of holies in the cloud above the mercy seat, um, which if you look at Leviticus 16 and 2, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, your brother, not to come in at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. He's really strict. If you, went in, if you went in there other than that one day, it, it didn't matter who you were. He, he had his rules. 
And dropping down to verse 13, And he shall put incense on the fire before the Lord, and the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, lest he die. And so it's just uh, interesting that he he had that rule, and his, his law was you did not go in there, and he had a whole set of rules, and it was the only way the Israelites could go to God was through the high priest, and that was only once a year. And so um, it, it's, it's also referenced in Exodus 25 and 22. And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in the commandment to the children of Israel. And that's how God would communicate with the high priest and, and give them guidance and direction and um, commandments uh, for the children of Israel. And so I just find that extremely interesting. They had to work through a temporary structure through the high priest once a year, whereas under the new covenant, again, our hope for salvation is through Christ. And we can go... There's nothing that stops us to go going to God at any time through prayer. We we can talk to Him now. We can talk to Him at bedtime. We can talk to Him any point in time when we're we're dealing the tri- trials of life. Under the old covenant, they could only do it once a year, and, and that was when the high priest was allowed to enter the holies of holies. Okay. Now, in what sense was the way into the holiest of holy, the holiest of all, not yet manifest during the period of time when the earthly tabernacle was in use? Referring to verse eight. Anybody want to take a shot at question three? So the holiest of all symbolized God's presence among his people. The actual holiest of all where God truly dwells is not here on earth, as we've discussed, but it is in heaven. Um, There are some commentaries that that try to assert that that the holiest of all is is the the church, um, the the New Testament church, which, you know, I'm happy to discuss with you all, but I believe the holiest of all is where God's, God is present and God is in heaven. Um, and the way to the holiest of all wasn't evident to anyone until Jesus came to earth, died, and then ascended into heaven. <clears throat> and as long as the tabernacle was there and standing, the approach to God by man was impossible. This bore witness to the fact that man could not just come directly to God. There was a heavy veil that, that Kyle read about, a very thick, heavy veil that separated man from God. It's significant that when Jesus was crucified, we read that the veil in the temple was torn from the top to the bottom, and man didn't do the ripping. God did the ripping. And it would have been, because if man had done it, it would have went from the bottom to the top. But God ripped the veil at the death of Christ, signifying that the way to the presence of God, now available for all men, you and I can come to the presence of God through Jesus uh, through, because of Christ's sacrifice for our sins. And we can see that in Mark, Mark uh, chapter 15, verse 37, 38. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice, and he breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. And I just find that, that amazing, that, that under the old law, it was temporary, and they could only the, the the high priest could only come once a year, but we're given the opportunity to reconcile with our God at all times. And I just it's a very powerful message, especially in this day and age with with, with stress and um, the the challenges that we see day to day. That we just know that we have that that capability to turn to God in, in prayer um, and, and give Him our problems and, and work through Him. And turn it all over to him and allow him to work through us. Joanna. I, say, I, I think I agree with you, Matt, that the holiest of all would be wherever, wherever the judge is sitting because it was the place of the mercy seat, the judge's bench, where the ruling was going to take place, where they had to bring the atonement. 
for their sins. Mm-hmm. So I think the holiest of all would be wherever the mercy seat is, and that would be where God is. Yeah, absolutely. Any other comments on the holiest of all? Yes. And just the, uh, there's a lot of things in life we, that we just can't comprehend, but what I can comprehend is that, that I have the ability to, to go talk to my God at any time, and I, I can share with him my thoughts and my feelings, and, and you know, I, it, the, the Israelites did not have that same ability, and so it's very humbling, um, very inspiring, very awe-inspiring. Um, when you stop and think about just what kind of access and how Jesus acts as our mediator to do that um, and uh, acting as our high priest as we've seen uh, in this book. Okay. So number four, talking about how does the writer describe the purpose and duration of the earthly tabernacle service and why is this important? So he describes the, in verses 9 and 10, he describes the purpose and duration of the earthly tabernacle to be symbolic for the present time. It provided ordinances related to the flesh until the time of the Reformation. The time of Re- Reformation uh, refers, I believe, to, to Jesus and his appearance on earth as man's Savior. And Jesus' sacrifice of himself would render the sacrifices offered under old law as obsolete and unnecessary. And so the, the earthly service, the, the worship and the sacrifices that was going on at the tabernacle were no longer necessary under the new covenant. Any thoughts on that? Okay. All right. Now we're going to kind of switch up a little bit here and uh, look at verses 11 through 15. And read with me, if you will, chapter 9, verse 11 through 15. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For as the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled the unclean sanctifies, for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the old covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. And I just captures what we were just talking about that that wow um, how much more is the blood of Christ the value of the blood of Christ so much more valuable than the blood of bulls and goats that were being sacrificed under the old covenant and so how is the sanctuary into which Christ entered as high priest different from the earthly sanctuary of the Levitical priests and how is his offering different from theirs <coughs> Shady. Where itself was described as not made with hands, not of this creation. I said it's referring to the physical world. And as to how his offering was different, the previous high priests who had come before him, the ones who served at the physical tabernacle, they offered the blood of other creatures, uh, goats, calves. But Jesus by being the one human to ever live a completely sinless and truly perfect life, that and also being the literal son of God, uh, 
was able to offer his own blood for a far superior sacrifice that opened the way for redemption and returning to God. Yeah, great point. And even though the, the, the animals that were sacrificed were without blemish and without per, were, were without blemish, Christ came and lived as a man without blemish, without spot. And so his sacrifice was so much greater. Um, he, Christ came as the high priest of the good things to come. His priesthood was based on the things that God appointed as blessings for all men, not just the Israelites, but for all men. The greater and more perfect tabernacle, the tabernacle which, into which Jesus entered, is superior and it is complete. It, it's not temporary. Yes? Oh yeah, yeah. In, in Normandy, yes. I think it must have been a very bloody mm-hmm. scene. Uh, I, I also think you know your previous question related to those verses up through ten. And he's he's still showing them how they're foolish to be to be to be thinking about going back to their. Mm-hmm. Physical Israel, their connection to physical Israel, to spiritual Israel, and again, just reinforcing that, handing that home. Why would you go back to that as physical sacrifice just for the body, where this is not just for the body, uh, this is for something spiritual in heaven? Yeah, and the difference between commandments written on stone and the spiritual commandments written on their hearts. Yep, great point. Joanna. That phrase, once for all, only appears a couple of times in the New Testament, and, and it denotes the completion of God's plan, that this high priest who lives forever is never going to be replaced. This sacrifice is never going to be done again. And Jude says the gospel was given once for all. It was complete at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for pointing that out. It is, um, it's, the the blood of, of goats and calves, um, is, is, isn't what was offered. Um, unlike the Levitical priests, um, it was not an animal sacrifice. Christ offered himself, um, and it was complete. It, it was, and it's eternal. It's eternal salvation. So what Christ has done for us gives us that opportunity not, not to go to heaven for a day. It's eternal salvation. Um, our home there is eternal which is a great point to, to think about as well, is about the salvation that we're looking for and the challenges of what we face today is temporary. You know, the, we're, we're pilgrims, um, oftentimes referenced, right? And so it, it's, it's easy to get caught up in the struggles of today's world, but what we need to focus on is that what we're fighting for is our eternal salvation, um, and that's what we're working towards. I like that you're making the postal applications for us because you see, while we can look at and see how, you know, sometimes, and there are still religions because they do not recognize and acknowledge Jesus' authority and supremacy, in essence, they're still wanting to leave under the Old Testament to be a religion that is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But in essence, all of this is to bring the significance to Christ so that by the time we get to chapter 10, this application of chapter 20 verse 29 of how much worse punishment do you suppose will be for the who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and come to the blood of the covenant by which you were sanctified a common thing? That's talking even to us. Imagine you're learning all of this about Jesus and the, the importance of that and then to carry on willfully sinning. Mm-hmm. Then the, the writer draws to our attention Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Mm-hmm. I will repay. This is something we do not want to take for granted. We want to appreciate this, internalize it. And I love the application you talk about. It's like, but think of how now you can take all your worries, your concerns, your thoughts, your, your prayers, and take it to God. And He has, and He cares, and He's telling you to stay faithful. Mm-hmm that we do not go for his sin. So there's a broader application that is coming towards us. Is it's like, let's truly appreciate what Jesus has done, the significance of what he has done to erase all the sins of the past and 
literally cleansed, you know, unlike the Old Testament, which just cleansed and purified the flesh, now even his sacrifice cleanses the conscience. And you come back to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. Mm -hmm. So in essence, there is a lot for us to take in and appreciate and to strengthen that relationship we have with God through his son, Jesus Christ. Yeah, absolutely. And just the fact that, you know, the, the Levitical priests had, had to, it was repetitive, continual sacrifices. Christ was so perfect. He only had to offer himself once for, for our sins. Um, and it provides that unceasing deliverance um, f from the penalty f uh, for sin. That, that sin that separates us from God, that sets us apart from, from our creator, our maker, Jesus provides that opportunity and that, that sacrifice that he, did, he gave for us allows us to, to become back in union by cleansing not just the flesh, but our conscience as well as you pointed out. Okay, one more question for, for this evening. Uh, question six, upon what basis was God able to offer forgiveness of sins to those who were under, those who were faithful under the old covenant? And this is verses 13 through 15. So the, the forgiveness that God offers is through Jesus to those who were faithful because those sins were rolled forward and Christ was one sacrifice for all. The animal sacrifices of the old law provided for the purification of the flesh, allowing men and the physical instruments they used to be used in God's service. Jesus' sacrifice cleanses man's conscience, wiping away all guilt, and provided for eternal fellowship with God. And I think it's so, so important that we understand that, um, you know, the, the, the grace and mercy that God has shown us by sending his son to, to this earth. And he knew from the beginning that, that this was necessary, and he still did it for us. And it's just, it's very humbling that we can have the, that forgiveness of sins, um, by Christ's sacrifice, and, and that we don't have to um, dwell on the old law to where we only have to wait for the high priest to go into the holies of holies uh, in order to do that for us. So, okay. With that being said, um, uh, next week in the last half of chapter 9, um, the author contrasts between the high priesthood of Christ um, that was established in, in chapters 4 through 7, and the old system can now be laid out in full with the result that we have in Christ can be most faithfully appreciated. The contrast between verse 1 and the tabernacle of the first covenant was earthly. The new covenant, Jesus exercises his high priestly role in greater and more perfect tabernacle in heaven itself. Um, any other comments before we close for this evening? Kyle. Kyle. Thinking about that last few statements you made um, about the redemption that was achieved through the blood of Christ, and I don't think I've always really appreciated the purpose of those animal sacrifices in the Old Testament and how the Jews, the Israelites, didn't, I don't, I don't know that they really appreciated either the fact that true redemption came through Christ. All the blood of those bulls and goats, they, they provided a ritualistic cleansing, mm -hmm. especially related to fleshly things that would be used in God's service, including the people that were used in God's service. There was a ritualistic cleansing of God's people as a whole, but that ritualistic cleansing did not purge away the guilt of sin as Christ's blood does. And uh, that's just a really impactful thought to contemplate that all of the blood, millions of animals over the years that were sacrificed, that was not sufficient wipe away the guilt of sin. Yeah, great point. It, it's, I find it extremely humbling. Um, just when you stop and, 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 and look at it, the, the, the plan God gave them and, and just the, the, the measurements and the type of, of wood and the type of cloth and the type of design and how long it would be and how tall it would be and how it would be used, God put all that in place with the plan that all those animal sacrifices would be completed with um, Christ's sacrifice for us. So thank you all for your comments. If you've got any questions, 
please or comments, please feel free to uh, let me know.